I want to welcome folks back to the 31st edition of our weekly Zoom conversations with people who have interesting connections to Margaret Chase Smith of the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And our guest today is Tyler Washburn. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. My pleasure. And where are you coming to us from today? I'm coming from Oars Island, Maine. I lived up in Bowdoin for many years, but recently I moved down here to be closer to the ocean and I almost drive by Senator Smith's summer home quite often now. Very good. Well, there's two connections for us. One, um, uh, Oars Island is a part of Harpswell and another section of Harpswell. It's essentially a set of peninsulas that stick out into the Atlantic Ocean and, uh, is Cundy's Harbor, and Margaret Chase Smith had a summer place on Cundy's Harbor. Have you ever been there? I haven't. I have always wanted to go, but unfortunately, it's not owned by the library, so we're not able to visit. Yeah, it's not all that accessible. Um, I don't know how much time you spent on the water, because I think actually the first time I saw it was actually from the water. Okay, very nice. Were you out sailing? I was with some friends and they very specifically wanted to take me over to see it. So they took me over in a motorboat to see Absolutely. it. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. And then I got to see it when we were in, when we had to clean it out for it to be sold. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then the other connection is that the library does a, a monthly book discussion series. And because of the Maine Bicentennial focusing on Maine authors, and our next book is The Pearl of Oars Island by Harriet Beecher Stowe. So, very another nice. Connect, another connection. So, Tyler, I'm interested in what are your first recollections of Margaret Chase Smith? And I guess one of the ways to ask that is Margaret Chase Smith passed away on May 29th, 1995. Were you born before or after that date? I was born before, but I don't remember 1995. I was born in 93. Okay. So how did someone so young, such as yourself, come to know about and get interested in Margaret Chase Smith? Well, I think my interest in Senator Smith started shortly after I got interested in politics. Mm -hmm. It was the summer before fourth grade, and Senator Collins gave me a shiny red campaign button at the Moxie Day Parade. My family lived near the parade group. And after that, I had no idea what a senator did, but I was hooked on the idea of politics. And as I got older, I really wanted to learn more about the folks that have represented Maine and been you know, on the national stage and commanding it. And you can't get far without running into Senator Smith's towering legacy. And mm -hmm. I remember the first time I really did deep, deep research was my freshman year of high school. We had to do a historical fiction essay or historical fiction paper in English class. And I did one on Senator Smith's Declaration of Conscience speech and what it was like the day leading up to it. Mm -hmm. I can say since then that I learned my essay, my paper was very fictional. <laughs> I did enjoy the conversation she had with Senator McCarthy, but I do think that from that point on, I really was always left with a strong sense of almost wonder at some of the accomplishments she had. And really, you know, as you look at today's climate in particular, I sure wish we had Margaret Chase Smith in Washington because she could speak softly, mm -hmm. but carry a big stick and really deliver a message that I think is lacking in our discourse right now more than anything. Mm -hmm. So you got interested in politics at a very young age, uh, as did I. Um, and do you have any accounting for that of how in the fourth grade you're already interested in government and politics? I think, you know, as I looked back, my Nana, who since has passed away for many years, was Chris Potholm's administrative assistant. Okay. And so I think as a young kid, I picked up on a lot of that. On my other side of the family, you know, we never had anyone run for office. My grandfather ran for the town council many, many years ago, lost and forswore politics. But I had two very young parents. And so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and mm -hmm. my grandparents would treat me oftentimes as an equal. And if they were at the kitchen table talking about the news of the day, I always wanted to have my own opinion. And 
And so I think between that, my Nana's experience, and again, that shiny button to me, just always, as I look back, that's the moment that I can really say it clicked in my brain that, you know, you can make a difference for other people and have fun, though, again, in the fourth grade, you don't know what a senator is. Funnily, on the way home, we lived in walking distance from the parade. My mom had taken away the shiny red button and said, you can't have that tie where she's a Republican. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, mom, what's a Republican? What's a Democrat on the way home? And she very quickly got me to understand her view of things, which flash forward two plus decades now, and her views have switched as well. But to me, little by little, you know, at the fourth grade, you don't really understand tax policy. By the eighth grade, you start to understand some of the more bedrock issues. But I think I've always tried in our school district, the motto has always been to be a lifelong learner. And so I'm the first person to be willing to say, I don't know enough about a subject, but mm -hmm. I always, from that early age, have wanted to learn more and really understand how you can bring folks together. Very good. So uh, you mentioned the, the uh, going to the Moxie Festival Parade. Did you grow up in the Lisbon area? So I did. We we moved around a bit, you know, when I was a kid, but from the first grade to the fourth grade, we lived right in downtown Lisbon Falls. Okay. My grandparents grew up in the Topsom Brunswick area. There was a period of time we were in New Gloucester, but ultimately we moved back to Bowdoin where on one side of my family, you could go back almost six generations. So mm -hmm. we moved around a, bu a bunch, but not very far from our roots. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to pick up on is you mentioned Chris Potholm. Uh, have you come to read some of his works and your studies? Absolutely. Chris Pot, sure. I, honest, I honestly think Chris Potholm is one of the most gifted political minds here in Maine. And his insider's guide to Maine politics, I think I have a dog-eared copy of that. There's another one, though, that really, I think, was my basic understanding, particularly in high school, was his this splendid game, which I actually, I have a dog-eared copy over on the other side. And that one I really enjoyed because it broke down Maine by the decades. And you could really see in particular, you know, what were the big issues of the time and how Maine changed. Because back in the early forties, when Senator Smith really got onto the national stage on the main stage, you know, Maine was a very different state than it was even in the sixties and seventies. And, you know, I will always enjoy in that book, there was a, I, I have to admit, when I ran for class president in high school, I might have lifted one of Senator Smith's campaign slogans, mm -hmm. because I was Tyler Washburn, the can do candidate with the can did record. And that mm -hmm. always to me, you know, that book, but Chris Potholm through and through, I think, understands Maine, mm -hmm. and really gets a lot of the nuances that I think, you know, I think are lacking a little bit nowadays. Maine is a very unique place. And I think that as we look at, I mean, if you even look at most recent campaigns and elections, we've started to go into a more national mold. And I think mm -hmm. that Chris understood that there has to be a Maine tradition and a Maine route behind that. Mm -hmm. So he is, uh, I don't know if he still is, but he was for a long time, a professor of government at Bowdoin College. Absolutely. Extremely knowledge, knowledgeable about the, the history and the, the nuts and bolts of Maine elections. Absolutely. Maine politics. All right, so um, you've given us some background of how you came to know about Margaret Chase Smith. Do you remember how the Margaret Chase Smith Library came onto your radar screen? Well, I remember it was that essay in high school was the first bit of the Margaret Chase Smith Library that came onto my radar screen, but I wasn't able to make it up. That was something I really had hoped. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had a good friend, Krista Moulton, when I was in, in high school, and Krista and her family brought me to the library the first time. Okay. And I can tell you that experience to me, it was just so amazing to see that much history in one place and to be able to go from the museum side of things, you know, with paperwork, documents, the archives, and to actually be able to step into Senator Smith's home and actually see that side of mm -hmm. things. And it really, 
to me, helped understand or at least bring about that there's a personal side to a lot of these people too, you know, histories made by people and Senator Smith was one of those towering people. Mm -hmm. For me, I know years later, I, you know, I've been a Republican for a long time, but as I've looked at the party and its evolutions, there have been several occasions, particularly the one that you, we, you and I've talked about. I've done some of my soul searching up there. And one of the most memorable experiences to me was to actually be able to see up close Senator Smith's speech notes for the Declaration of Conscience speech, which I still think is one of the Senate's best speeches in history for the United States Senate, not just Senator Smith. I mean, the whole institution. And I think those messages are ones that I wish we'd hear more of today. But the library for me, and I know Dr. Melcher, when I went to UMF, was a frequent proponent of the annual town meetings, which I still have been wanting to attend. And I hope that one of these days I can get time off from work and actually get up there because you guys do a phenomenal job of bringing folks of different sides of the spectrum and different parts of history and really educate. And I think that's awesome. Thank you. Um, a couple things in there that I, I wanted to discuss. First of all, you, you reminded me that, you know, we're in the pandemic, essentially, we're, we are technically open to the public um, by reservation, but, you know, we're not getting many visitors with the pandemic going on. And the realization that we've been creating a lot of content to put on the internet. Uh, but you pointed out, there is a value to actually coming here because even when we're in the museum section and we're showing students photos of Margaret Chase Smith, it becomes an entirely different experience when they walk through the front door of her house because yeah, that's the moment she becomes a real person. Even though she's not alive anymore and even though she's not living in the house anymore, we've left it just the way it was when she passed away. Um, so we're hoping to be able to get back to that experience. It's not the same to give a virtual tour of the house. Um, we, we still need that, that physical presence of people being able to be here and see her house and see that we've left it. Just I mean, it one, one piece that I mean, even years later still sticks out to me is the candy dish that Senator Smith had yeah. and the president's bedroom, which, you know, President. suddenly you start to think President Dwight Eisenhower was right here in this room. And as a history yeah. buff like me, it just, it gives you goosebumps to think about. One of the people I've interviewed was um, a teacher, an enrichment resources teacher in Skowhegan. And he tells the story of how, one of the manifestations of his love of history. When he was a kid, his family would take cross country trips because he had some family out in Colorado and they lived in Massachusetts. And one year they stopped in Springfield, Illinois because he wanted to go to Abraham Lincoln's house. And he said when he got there, he stood at the, the front stoop and he, put his feet everywhere on that front stoop because he wanted to be standing in the spot that Abraham Lincoln had once been standing. So yeah, when you're in the Eisenhower room, you're in the, the room where President Eisenhower was took a nap. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, very good. Um, so you had mentioned about coming up here to do research and I'm gonna share the screen and show a photo of you doing that research. That was back in 2015, and you talked about um, coming to do some soul searching. Do you want to elaborate on that? I, I, I think for me, looking back, I'm, that was at a time when I felt that the Republican Party was drifting further away from some of its ideals that it was founded on. I think that the Republican Party was getting more conservative. Mm -hmm. I've always been a very moderate person in my views, especially as I've gotten older. And so I remember at that time, this is pre-President Trump being the nominee, pre at near the tail end or shortly after Governor LePage had gotten in mm -hmm. for the second term. And, you know, both men that have had a fair share of accomplishments, but their tone, mm -hmm. I think sometimes was something that was difficult for me. And I wanted to get up there and see somebody, you know, that this is the reason I'm a Republican or people like Margaret Chase Smith. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that a party always has to be bigger than a person. Mm -hmm. And I think that Senator Smith would have agreed to something like that, that it's the broader principles that unite us, not 
the personalities that dominate it. As I have continued some of that journey, I know that when moving to Harpswell a few weeks ago, I'd uh, come in and do my voter registration. And one of the struggles I've had is, you know, is maybe there are stances and positions the party takes that don't necessarily mirror me. I do have to admit and fully say that, you know, it was Israel Washburn, a governor of Maine, congressman at the time that helped found this party. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look in the Declaration of Conscience speech, Senator Smith in particular talked about not wanting a party to ride to victory on the four horses of calumny, bigotry, smear, intolerance, and fear. And I think that we need to get back to a message similar to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I stayed enrolled in my party. That's something that, you know, I, I have friends that have left. I have friends that have joined. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think that it's about what are the broad principles that unite us? And are those principles bigger than personality? And that's something I've had to wrestle with over the years. That day in particular, you know, I'm smiling an awful lot. I think one of the other consistencies is I had a bad hair day then too. <laughs> this time I can blame it on the pandemic, that day not so much. But I think that we really want to focus on, or at least I do, areas where people can come together. President Reagan had a great quote, somebody that agrees with you 80% of the time is a friend and ally, not a 20% traitor. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm a big tent guy and mm -hmm. that, you know, Aside from that, I have a pretty nonpartisan job now, which is a very helpful position to be in, especially during these climates. But all told, you know, Senator Smith to me really was a beacon of, you know, this is how you can be somebody that is passionate in your convictions. I mean, you could not find somebody, I think, that was less passionate in her views on foreign policy and elsewhere, but still all around recognize that we're Americans first and anything else comes after that. Mm -hmm. I don't so think I'm mischaracterizing. You uh, gave a little quote from the Declaration of Conscience, but I'm wondering uh, on that day when you were here and did some research, what, what things in that speech do you remember that stood out to you? And in particular, I mean, you could have just gone online and read the speech, but you wanted to come here and, and see it. And one of the things that you come when you see it is the different Each itera of iterations that it went through. Well, and that and that was one of the things that was so powerful to me too. You know, as you look at you look at the different rights that she enumerates. So that's a part of the speech that's always stuck with me as well. And that the exercise of those rights shouldn't cost anyone their position, stature, or their reputation. But to be able to see on the speech notes themselves where Senator Smith crossed words out and wrote in different ones to be able to see where she circled in red yeah. or underlined it at points of emphasis. Yeah. To me, you know, you can read the speech. The U.S. Senate has a great four-page PDF of it, mm -hmm. but it's not the same as actually being able to see the segments that she really wanted to enumerate. And I think those sections that have stuck out to me probably are etched in there partially because of those red underlines, crosses, and circles. Mm -hmm. Very good. So the, the, I, I was trying to think about my awareness of you, and I'd forgotten about the Krista Moulton angle, but I sort of have a sense that another way that I came to learn about you is through Facebook. I think you, 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 um, my recollection is that you were one of the early friends of Margaret Chase Smith yeah. um, when we adopted Facebook. And so one of the things I remember from that is back to the 2016 election, presidential election cycle. Um, you had lots of posts during that election cycle. Uh, can you tell people what your gimmick was at that time? So back in 2016, I worked for a consulting firm that was consulting on AARP's Take a Stand campaign, where AARP was focusing on trying to get all of the presidential candidates committed to talking about social security and making the program solvent for current and future generations. Mm -hmm. And one of the approaches that they took is they didn't really want to grade plans or score plans because they wanted a social security and Medicare have become, I, I genuinely think, and I think others would agree, you know, the area that folks don't want to talk about because it immediately becomes a campaign ad. And I think the organization really tried to find ways 
to encourage people to actually have those discussions without taking sides so it would be a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And so part of my job, I was based in New Hampshire out of Manchester, and then I traveled on to a bunch of other states, was to help recruit volunteers to go to these events and actually interact, direct, interact directly with the candidates. And days we didn't have volunteers, it'd be me, you know, it'd be our staff. But what was really exciting about it, when you're in New Hampshire in particular, mm -hmm. or one of those early states, you get an upfront close view of democracy that, you know, I can say as a political science student, I kind of shrugged off and said, oh, you know, I don't think it's fair that New Hampshire gets it. But I have since adopted the honorary New Hampshire method that if I don't meet a candidate at least three times, I really can't consider voting for them. And I say that facetiously, but to be able to have that front row seat to history and that to me was one of the coolest parts. I was there the night of the New Hampshire primary. I actually started out New Hampshire primary day up in Dixville Notch mm -hmm. and got to watch the, at that time, I believe it was 11 voters. One, the only female voter in Dixville Notch voted absentee. Mm -hmm. So it's this room of 10 white men going out to vote, you know, as they always have in Dixville Notch first and at midnight. And to see that was a lot of fun. It was also fun to be able to spend time with Gordon Humphrey, a former Senator from New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. He was there, he was pulling big for John Kasich. And that, building was filled with a lot of international media because of the sales pitch of it all. And so Senator Humphrey kind of laid low waiting to see how the results would go. And so I had about two hours just to pick his brain, which was the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. And after the vote in Dixville Notch on the Republican side, John Kasich got three votes. Donald Trump got two and John Kasich in New Hampshire had called all five of those people. And Senator Humphrey was a little discouraged going, I thought we'd win more. And I said, Senator, you've got 60% of the vote right now. <laughs> and so after there, I was able to go on to South Carolina, Florida, Wisconsin, New York, and Indiana and see their primaries. Mm -hmm. And it was really, again, fun to be there through the throes of that race and have a purpose that was really, I felt a pretty noble one. You know, Social Security as a millennial, I genuinely don't think it's going to be there for me, but I pay into it out of every paycheck. And mm -hmm. I look at folks like my parents that, you know, my mother would hate it, but as they start to think about retirement age nearing or my grandparents, it's a program that at its inception wasn't meant to be the base all of retirement, but for a lot of seniors it is. And so the thought that come 2034, seniors could see across the board cuts to social security because Congress can't get its act together and find common sense solutions that bring people together, you know, Reagan and Tip O'Neill. And I know I pontificate a little bit, so I'm sorry I meander with my answers, but Reagan and Tip O'Neill, two polar opposites politically, you had a Massachusetts liberal and a California conservative, were able to solve the social security problem for over 50 years, but it requires continued work. And mm -hmm. so to me, it was really fun. I get to meet all of the candidates that made it to New Hampshire. There were a handful I didn't, but to watch the race up close was a lot of fun as well. I grew up in New Hampshire, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I remember uh, in the, around the Portsmouth area. Very nice to see folks. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember sitting at my brother's basketball game and seeing Gary Hart just walk right into the auditorium, you know, going to my high school auditorium and Jimmy Carter giving a speech. Uh, so um, Gerald Ford driving in a motorcade through my hometown, so. Doorstep yeah. democracy. Yeah, yeah, very much. Very direct contact with presidential candidates. Going to a Holiday Inn in, in, uh, in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire when I was in, in high school to hear Howard Baker give his campaign pitch. That's very, awesome. Very up close and personal. So what I remember from Facebook, uh, as you're going around in the 2016 campaign for AARP, is you would try to get your photos taken with the candidates. Um, and were, were there a lot in the, there were a lot in the field in, for the Republicans in 2016, is that correct? There were, it was a pretty, pretty wide field. I know that I, there were a handful I didn't make because they didn't make it out of Iowa, but okay. the ones that focused, because I think 
as you look at the different states, there were some candidates that focused on New Hampshire because they had a more independent mindset. New Hampshire was an open primary, mm -hmm. whereas Iowa is more your evangelical conservative side of things on and one that's, side. That's a caucus state. Yes. Yeah, and as a caucus, so you have different dynamics, but I will admit, I, I jokingly told my family I wanted to write the book of the art of the selfie, my story of 2016, <laughs> because I, I really got to meet all of them. I mean, Hillary, Bernie, it, it, was, mm -hmm. it wasn't until Appleton, Wisconsin, that I actually got the selfie with Bernie, mm -hmm. but, you know. Did he have the mittens on? He did not. I, you <laughs> know, I have to say, though, I, I have to say, he, he gave his speeches. He had the best music. Because after a certain point of going to events, yeah. you know, you're listening to what's said, but you start to pick up on body language, you start to pick up on the tiny details, the types of people that attend the events as well. Bernie Sanders had the best music. Mm -hmm. I think that Jeb Bush was the most traditional of the sense of candidates that ran the textbook campaign. Mm -hmm. John Kasich's speech, you know, I could almost recite because I heard it so many times, but it was a ton of fun. I will say that New Hampshire bug in particular, this past election cycle, I did make a few trips down to New Hampshire mm -hmm. to go see folks because I, I have to say, whatever side of the aisle you're on, wherever you fall on the spectrum, there's something to be said about showing up as your democracy is on the front lines and hearing people directly. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I remember in particular, President Obama came to Maine to give a speech about Obamacare he did in Portland. Mm -hmm. And even though I disagreed on a lot of issues with him at the time, you know, and I say that as a kid, but I went and I wanted to be there and see it. When Lady Gaga came to South Portland, or not to South Portland, to Portland at Deering Oaks, to give the big speech on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which for a lot of folks, that was a very big issue and a big momentous time. I wanted to be there to see it. And so this time around, I, I did get to give Elizabeth Warren a hug. That was an experience that I'll always cherish, but you know, it, it really is not hard, particularly for those of us in Maine to get down there. And I think a lot of folks think democracy is far away from them, but it's a lot closer than they think. You just have to know where to look. Mm -hmm. Very good. Tangents, I apologize. No, no, that's fine. I, I was just thinking, uh, Did you, you said you heard Bernie give a speech in Appleton, Wisconsin? Yes. I think that was um, Joe McCarthy's base of operations. Did you? I think, I think you're right. And I think he actually brought that up. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's, we've gotten a little ahead of ourselves in that you brought up something that I wanted to touch upon is part of your training and understanding of politics came from your time in college. You went to the University of Maine at Farmington and uh, came in a way under the wing of a, a very animated, dynamic political science professor there named Jim Melcher. Uh, what can you say about your time at UMaine Farmington and how that shaped your development? I, I can tell you my freshman year of college, I was at the University of Maine in Orono. Okay. And I made the decision to transfer because I wanted to, at UMaine, there were a lot of political science lecture classes and that really didn't fit my learning style the best. I really, I wanted to be able to have those one-on-one -on -one discussions. And when I went to the University of Maine at Farmington, one of my first classes was with Dr. Melcher. And I can tell you to this day, I owe so much of the encouragement of me back at that time mm -hmm. to Jim Melcher. I mean, he above and beyond to me exemplifies what an ideal professor is because he's somebody that is so passionate about the subject that it wakes you up. And, you know, there, there are kids like me that were always going to be a little bit engaged in political science, but mm -hmm. Dr. Melcher took it to a whole new level, whether it was his varying degrees of impressions, which... I will tell you, there is no man I know alive today that can do more impressions than Dr. Melcher, but there's an inherent kindness in him as well, where he genuinely wants folks to learn and think for themselves mm -hmm. and is willing to play the devil's advocate sometimes. You know, there were times that we disagree passionately in class about 
public policy or a whole host of things, but he truthfully encouraged me at a time when I think I really needed it. And mm -hmm. I, I, I just can't speak well enough of Jim Melcher. I mean, he truthfully is the quintessential professor that I had a chance to go up and talk to his practical politics class a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And just being around him, it's infectious, the level of energy in the background. I threw a couple of Easter eggs in my presentation. You know, I had a who am I and why am I here quote from Admiral Stockdale, mm -hmm. which Dr. Melcher then had to educate the whole class on it. But truthfully, just such a, a good guy and really passionate about the subject at UMF. I also was really lucky. One thing that I've learned as a young person that wants to be involved in the process is that one experience usually will open the door to the next one. And sometimes those experiences you don't realize. I know that I had Senator Saviello, Frank, mm -hmm. Tom Saviello was the Senator for Franklin County. And he was one of my political science. He was an adjunct professor that taught Maine politics. And that experience turned into me taking a break and actually going to be his committee clerk in Augusta. Mm -hmm. And it was those experiences there that exposed me to folks that were on that AARP side of things. And, and so to me, it's UMF opened a lot of doors for me and also gave me connections and lifelong friends. You know, I, Tom Saviello, I will still pick up the phone and call and he'll still give me a hard time when I need it. And the same with Dr. Melcher, but mm -hmm. truthfully all around great people. And I wish we had more people like Dr. Melcher or Tom or elsewhere, because they really, I think, you know, higher education, you have some really great professors and you have some that are as dry as can be. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I like the entertain. I mean, I, Dr. Melcher's class is phenomenal. Yeah, it's quite an experience to get to go to a Jim Melcher talk or lecture. Do you have a favorite impression? I think that his Bill Clinton impression is my favorite. Okay. And he'd probably be a little embarrassed for me to admit it, but I knew I was in the right place when for our first final exam that Dr. Melcher had, when he left Wisconsin, one of, or when he left one of his early teaching places, the department got him a Bill Clinton cardboard cutout mm -hmm. and he brought it with him to, to us in my class. I remember he had Bill Clinton in the corner to remind us what happens if you misbehave, you know, <laughs> pay attention in class, but his Bill Clinton was phenomenal. His Richard Nixon, you know, he's very emphatic with. That mm -hmm. one had a lot more mannerisms. He did a very good Reagan, but mm -hmm. by far, I could not even attempt to do his Bill Clinton justice. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite? Uh, Elvis. If you can work Elvis into a political science lecture. <laughs> did, he, did he do that when he did the town meeting talk? Uh, I'm trying to remember because he, he, he did give a, a main town meeting presentation. I've also heard several of his talks that he does uh, at the University of Maine Farmington for Constitution Day. Yeah. Where he does, does the reviews of like the top 10 Supreme Court cases of the yeah. previous year. And I know somewhere along the line, I've heard him do an Elvis impression. Well, I'm going to have to ask him to remind me of that one. <laughs> uh, and the other thing that very much impresses me about him is... I'll see these testimonials to Dr. Melcher and they come from all over the political spectrum. Right. So, I mean, he probably does have a particular point of view, but he's very much encouraging of all the points of views of his students. Absolutely. All right. So you talked about giving a lecture or talk in Dr. Melcher's practical politics class. So something else that has stood out to me about you is you're a young person, but you're already very civically engaged. You already are holding roles of, in public office. Um, tell us about that. So I, I think that on the political side of things, I've done the campaigns, I've done issue advocacy. Mm -hmm. One of the most rewarding experiences of my life, but also the most frustrating was my time on the SAD 75 school board. Mm -hmm. I got to represent my hometown for two and a half years. I resigned a little bit ahead of my term, expiring to move down here to Harpswell. And that was a really tough decision because I knew there was a lot of work ahead of us, particularly as we try to get schools reopened mm -hmm. fully as soon as safely possible. But, you know, 
Bowdoin, it's very interesting. Different towns have different styles of democracy and Bowdoin, you get elected at town meeting. And so if you wanna get elected, either selectmen, school board, et cetera, you have to have 50% plus one of the people in the room. And my little sister Belle's first ever vote and Belle is as far away from I am as it can be politically. Mm -hmm. came out to vote for me. And that's something that I ended up running against three folks or two other folks. There were three of us. I had an overall majority of one. Mm -hmm. So my sister liked to remind me that if I deviated too far, she'd switch sides. But, okay. you know, I, during my first couple months on the board, we ended up having a little bit of a leadership crisis where we had to remove one of our officers. Mm -hmm. And the way our district works, not every district's the same, you rotate the school board chair through each of the four towns in the district. So, you know, Bowdoin only had two members, whereas Topsom has six. Mm -hmm. And so the lady that we ended up removing was from my hometown and I had to step in and step up to become the school board chair, the youngest in the history of our district during what was at that time seemed to be one of our more tumultuous times. You know, flash forward now, that seemed easy, but... Yeah. We were in the middle of difficult teacher contract negotiations, trying to hire a superintendent. I mean, there was a one year period where we went through what if you count one year, one day, we had four different superintendents. And so we were able to get to a point where there was a little more stability. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found most rewarding ever, you know, if I stopped being involved in the process today, I'm so proud that during the pandemic, one of the needs that really stuck out to me was our need to make sure we feed our neighbors, particularly kids that rely on free and reduced lunch program. In my town, 38% in the good economy qualified for free and reduced lunch. And so with job losses, et cetera, we had different pickup sites for families to go to to pick up food. And we mm -hmm. ended up being told by the state, we were told that we had to shut down the site in Bodenham because it was too close to the site in Bowdoin. Yeah. And I genuinely struggled with the idea that we're a district of four towns and we're telling one town in the middle of the pandemic when we're telling folks to stay at home, you've now got to go cross lines. You know, if you're difficult with gas, food, I mean, across the board, it just didn't sit well with me. And mm -hmm. I worked to build some consensus on the board. It took a couple of weeks and going back and forth with different administrators. And we finally got it on the agenda. And we on the board said, you know what, we'll eat the cost. And excuse the pun, I didn't even realize there was a pun mm -hmm. there, but- You've we'll, been around Belcher too long. I, I know, it just, but I said, we said in a voice that we're gonna pay for it because it's the right thing to do. And ultimately after you take a stand like that, I was very pleased to see that the state of Maine changed course and told us they would reimburse us after all, but the ability to stand up for folks that really, you know, didn't feel comfortable advocating for themselves. You know, I had phone calls and emails of the hardships that folks went through. That will always be a rewarding experience. I, you know, right now I work at the town of Topsom. I'm a deputy town clerk. During the pandemic, I was the acting town clerk for a few months and trying to plan an abs a largely absentee ballot election during a pandemic, you know, phenomenal experience, but also very stressful and trying to make sure, you know, our democracy is safeguarded and ensure that everybody can vote that, you know, wants to. You wanna make sure that every eligible vote cast can be in there because that's how you make a difference. And so that experience is phenomenal. One thing that I really enjoy right now at work it's one of the many hats you wear between registering cars, voter registration, dog licenses, which you would not believe the nuance that goes into dog licenses, but I won't <laughs> bore you with that. But my favorite part of the job is that when somebody's appointed to a town board or a town committee, I get to swear them in. And mm -hmm. to me, that is the, the bedrock, the base of the whole process is that oath where you swear to support and defend the constitution of this state and the United States, that's a really powerful feeling to be able to do that. And, you know, each time it gives me a little bit of goosebumps just because I take it seriously. And I know that the folks that are getting sworn in do, but, you know, I, I've always enjoyed being able to make a difference when I can and where I can. 
And right now, you know, I'm going to be an actively engaged community member, but it's funny. And I don't mean to keep bringing up, I mean, I'm not saying it just because I'm talking to the Margaret Chase Smith Library, but on one of my visits up to the library, there was a pamphlet that was Senator Smith's creed. Mm -hmm. And I have that up on my desk mm -hmm. because to me that fundamentally is the bedrock of, you know, it's more than just doing a job. Yeah. It's being there for the people. And that, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And as an aside on the Facebook posts you used to do, mm -hmm. I do know and I need to find it. I had it up at home before I moved. I had a great picture that I stole off of the Facebook that you'd posted of Senator Smith with Winston Churchill, because next oh, yeah. to my next to my creed at home or on my desk at work, I also have a picture of Winston Churchill. Because those two, if I if there were two Northern Lights to go by, it's those two. Well, I will make sure in the next week or so we repost that photo. Awesome. So you can grab it again. And I think Anthony Eden's in that one too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, one of the questions I always like to ask school kids when they're here, and you're well beyond that now, but you're still young in your career. What is your career aspiration? I think that that's a good question. If you asked me when I was a school kid, I'd want to be a state representative for life. That was always the thing that I aspired what? to. You can't. There's term limits. And as I got older. Unless you're John Martin, you can't pull it off. Well, and, and leave it to, it was fun when I was a committee clerk, John Martin was actually one of the members of my committee. And so, mm -hmm. it, so fun to see that up close. But I also learned you can't exactly live off of that kind of salary. It's a very part-time position, but I don't know where I want to end up other than I want to be in a place where I can help make a difference for my neighbors. I mean, fundamentally, whether that's continuing on the path in municipal government, you know, being there to help with those side of things. But to me, my goal has always been to try to make things a little bit better if I can and to find common ground. And I think people like me in these polarized climates more than ever need to stay engaged because as you get deeper rancor on whatever side of the aisle you're on, that sliver in the middle, I mean, I have this this hope and dream that somehow in the next Congress, Senator Collins, Murkowski, King, and Manchin form a caucus that forces folks to actually share power and work together. Mm -hmm. As I think we've gotten to a point where the ends are starting to justify the means and winning is more important than legislating, which that's not the question you asked, where do I want to end up? But mm -hmm. I really want to find a way that I can make a difference, but at the same time, I understand why good people don't run. I understand why good people are taking a step back because, you know, it's touch football right now. And sometimes it hurts. It's, it's, wait a minute. It's full tackle football right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's even an understatement because, I mean, there was a gentleman and talking about doors opening. Back in 2018, I ended up working for the state Senate a little bit in the Senate chamber. And I ended up after that working on the campaigns for one of the sides. Mm -hmm. And there was a candidate in my area that to this day, I will always consider an absolute good guy, retired Navy veteran, had a different sense of humor than I did. Mm -hmm. And he posted memes on Facebook that were inside jokes between him and a Navy buddy that when taken out of context, look pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But it was a sense of humor that was not mean-spirited. It wasn't the way he was portrayed. And to this day, there are people that won't in his hometown talk to him anymore because they were upset by this little sliver of something taken out of context. Mm -hmm. And I think when you find, I mean, he's a retired Lieutenant Commander in the Navy who's very proud of the fact that he has a mixed race family. And to have charges in the local newspaper that you're a racist because you shared a joke up with a buddy on Facebook that, you know, I think, would I have shared that joke on Facebook? Probably not. I had Margaret Chase Smith watching. But mm -hmm. in the same breath, you know, Rich, even after the campaign was over and he didn't win, there was an opening. You know, I, when the one difficult thing about working on the political side of things and why I'm really enjoying municipal government is that 
if an election result goes one way, you might have a job. And if it goes another way, you know, you're out looking. And there was an opening to be the bookkeeper for the Georgetown Fire Department. Rich lived in Georgetown and also work at the town office. And he saw my work ethic. He saw that I was somebody that was competent, that needed a little bit of experience, but put in a good name and a good recommendation. And I was able to learn skills in Georgetown that prepared me for the job that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for a good man like Rich Donaldson, you know, who I, I don't know what I'd be doing today, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think we need to be less quick to point fingers and recognize that everybody deserves a certain level of decency and a chance to say their side of the story, because there really are two sides to every story. You talked about some of your successes in elective office and some of the challenges. Do you think you have a return to running for political office? I think that I definitely have that ambition someday. Mm -hmm. You know, right now I'm focused on doing my job and being a town clerk, you know, working on the election side of things, it limits some of the things that you can do politically or not, mm -hmm. you know, but I also am a firm believer in the first amendment and a right to free speech and participate and everything else that is along that. You know, someday I think I'll probably put my name on the ballot and run for something else, but. I also think I just moved to Harpswell. I, in particular, know this is a town that is not fond of carpetbaggers, you know, people from away. But mm -hmm. in the same breath, I think if you're going to run to represent a community, you really need to understand it. You need to understand their issues, their needs. And, you know, in this area, I, this is my first generation here in Harpswell. But if you look up in Brunswick, another area, you know, you can go back almost five generations with my family, Bowden and elsewhere. So mm -hmm. someday I'd like to run. I don't know for what yet. Something that I can reasonably say I'm doing it not because of me, but because I want to accomplish this. I want to accomplish, you know, finding a way. One thing I'm super passionate about that most folks wouldn't know, I really hope that we in Maine can find a way to tap into the tidal power that's off the Bay of Fundy. Mm -hmm. I think if we want to be leaders in renewable energy, which is not something people usually hear from my side of the aisle, you know, I think you need to look at what works locally. I would love to play a part in helping make sure that we could have tidal turbines out there that could help generate clean renewable power. But that's something that I'm not in a spot today where I know I could contribute to that other than raise awareness to the issue and things like this. So someday, but it has to be for the right reasons. Very good. Well, I thank you for taking the time to speak with us and share about your past and some of your ambitions and where your interest in politics came from. And I wish you success as you proceed through your career, both professionally and perhaps running again for political office. Thank and, you. I, and I hope that we get to run into each other again at New Orleans for pancakes. Yes, or at the Margaret Chase Smith Library. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.